Amen. Turn to Acts chapter 2 if you would. I'm going to put my microphone on my tie so my tie will be correct. Um, Acts chapter 2. And as I mentioned a while ago, I've got some things to share with you. Some of them is going to be up on the screen. And uh, I I fell uh, upon a book in my collection, and I'll be honest with you, I have no idea where it came from. Um, I may have picked it up somewhere, somebody may have sent it to me, uh, and I just, I've been looking at it for a while, and I am, um, I'm filling my head with knowledge of how we got this Bible, okay? It's not like God parachuted a box of Bibles down from heaven and with a note saying, copy this, okay, and do it right. Um, the story of the Bible, to me, is, is as interesting as the Bible is to read because the story of how we got our Bible dis- displays the character and nature of the Bible. When you read the Bible and understand even the simplest parts of it, then you understand the history of the Bible. As people have, have died for the faith, of Jesus Christ, believing in the blood atonement and not believing in the Pope of Rome and not submitting to the popes as people shed blood for the cross, saints have died just for having a page of the Bible in their language, in their house. They have died for that. That's not a joke either. That is the truth. That is the gospel truth. And... Um, Boy, I tell you what, it's a, it's a beautiful story, but it'll, it'll make, it, it, it's helped me uh, just have a, a, a deeper regard for God's Word. I came by this book easily. I mean, I didn't have to do much to reach over and get a King James Bible. My mama bought me one when I was in Sunday school here, little, with the little colored pages in it, one of those. It's King James. And when I... Started preaching, 16 years old. My mama bought me another Bible, big one. And um, then when I went off to Bible college, she got me another one. And um, that's just the Bibles I've had in my life. And, but there have been people who have paid dearly so that you could have this book freely. I'm not, I, it's, yeah, I'm, I'm serious about it. But anyway, it's a, it's a beautiful story. And it does, it does start here in the, in the second chapter of Acts. When you understand what God is doing here and the the signal that he's sending to the world and the signal that he's... Because what did Paul say about tongues? Tongues were a sign. But he said they were a sign not to those who believe, but to those who believe not. And on the day that these tongues came down, they're all Gentile languages. They're not speaking in Hebrew With a change of the law comes a change of the lawgiver, Christ, and comes a change of the priesthood of that law, Christ. Then comes a change of the language of that law, Greek. Hebrew was the sole custody of the Jews. Greek was spoken by the farmer, by the woodworker, by the vineyard owner. By the housewife. That's the, the Greek of the common man. And these languages here in Acts chapter 2 are the languages of the factory worker, the farmer, the peasant, and the rich man alike. Acts chapter 2 verse 4. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And I would, I would ask... If anybody, if anybody ever wanted to contradict you, like on social media or as maybe it's a friend of yours, a family member, and they question why you only use one Bible. And uh, let's see here. Where was I going with this? Okay, yeah. And the, the, the main theory that's now in almost every church Almost every Bible college, Bible institute, seminary around the world is 
The Word of God is only perfect in the original manuscripts. It is only perfect on the papyrus that was written on by Paul, Peter, James, John, or the vellum written on by Isaiah or Moses or anybody else. Only those copies of the Word of God are perfect. Every other copy since then is imperfect and not, not pure. But that's not what God did on the day of Pentecost. He didn't speak Hebrew to those people. He spoke mo even more than Greek. He spoke all the languages of the people. And that's what they said. They were amazed and marveled. Read it. When, uh, verse, uh, verse 5, And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. See, the Jews had to be there to see this happen because it's a sign to them. God's saying to them, I'm done. It's Hebrew, okay? They understood it. Well, that, that Hebrew sound, I just cleared my throat doing that. The Jews were there to witness this because it was a sign to them. As God said, uh, with stammering lips and another tongue will I speak to this people. And the Jews, as they did not understand Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, they did not understand this. Uh, under, under heaven, verse 6, Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. This was foreordained of God. It was pronounced by God, prophesied by God. It was intended by God. And it was done by God because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, in Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, in Egypt and in the parts of Libya, about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. Father, bless your word tonight. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, now Isaiah chapter 11. Um, as I said, this was always intended by God. One of the things that I can clearly see in Bible history... And, I, and I'm speaking like from the time of Christ on till now. One of the things I can clearly see in Bible history is that there has always been a war of two sides fighting over control of the word of God. There, are, there was always a faction of people who stood adamantly against passing the scriptures around to the common people because... This Bible has power in it. And a man who lusts for power can use the words from this book to wield power over people. I hate to say it like this. Have you seen the, the movie, The Book of Eli? Yeah. That guy wants the Bible. He says the words in it. He said, I could rule, I could rule everything if I just had the word. Idiot. There's a contradiction in that movie. When, when the guy shows up there to, uh, what's that prison in San Francisco? That's where, that's where they're at, huh? Alcatraz. He says, I have a King James Bible. And then, so they let him in. And they said, what condition is? He says, it's a, little, it's a little rough, but it works. And so he begins quoting. And the book that they put on the shelf says, New King James Bible. And, it's a, there's a, and there's a double contradiction in there because when he starts out in Genesis, part of what he's saying is from the King James, part of what he's saying is from the New King James. The phrase, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Singular heaven is from the King James. Heavens and the earth is from the New King James. Huh? Yeah. So uh, whether, it's, whether it was deliberate or just ignorance, 
They should have let, let me in on the movie. I could have helped them out with that. Okay? They, I could have, I would have got paid well for it too. Anyway, uh, there should come forth, a, God, here's what I'm going to get back to saying this. There's always been a war. And it's over the men who have wanted to withhold this book from the common people. Even before the Roman church, there was a battle over this book. Paul said, for we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. They, they were already doing it. The, Paul had not even finished writing his letters. John has not seen the kingdom of God in the New Jerusalem. None of this has happened. And already you have Gnostics who are taking these gospels and they're taking these letters. And they're going, you know what? We can change these. We can cha take this word out. We can take these words out here and we can do things like that. In fact, why don't we just, why don't we just change this and then we'll write another gospel and say it came from Peter. Peter didn't write no gospel. Why don't we write a gospel and say it came from Mary Magdalene? Where it has Jesus kissing Mary Magdalene on the mouth. And they have like a little romance going on there. And Peter and the other disciples are jealous because Mary's getting all the attention from Jesus. That's sick. But that's a, that's a real, ancient gospel work. Okay? Which is, like Paul said, which is not another gospel. It's not a gospel. It's bad news. Including the gospel of Judas Iscariot. One copy they found, half eaten in the desert, but there's enough in it to know that they played Judas out to be good cop, bad cop with Jesus. Jesus is going to be the good cop. Judas gets to be the bad cop. But Jesus said, in exchange, I'm going to give you this secret mystery doctrine that I got from John the Baptist. Because John the Baptist was the teacher of Jesus. And that's how that's displayed in the Gnostic Gospels. And this was already being corrupted. And so by the time the Roman church came around and Constantine ordered copies of the New Testament to be written out, he ordered 50 copies of the New Testament to be written out, they got a hold of these corrupt copies with all the words missing, like 1 John 5, 7. And I counted between the King James and the NIV over... One, you can look this up on Blue Letter Bible, and I'm going to make the mistake, but it was well over a hundred times the NIV took the word, the name Christ, out of the text of the New Testament. Over a hundred times. Okay? We know that Christ is in the New Testament 555 times. Variants of that, like Christ with apostrophe S on there, the total is like 589. And when you compare that with the number that's in the NIV, it's, it's, it's almost like 150 less than. And that's what they took out, including the last verse of the book of Revelation. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. All of the modern translations say, may the grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. Amen. They've taken out all and they've taken out Christ. If he's not Christ, he's not Messiah. He's not anointed. And over 150 times, they have removed his anointing from him. So I, I, just take, I just take opposition to that. Do it once, and I'll look the other way. Do it 150 times, I'm going to bark. Amen? But anyway, but then there has always been those men, even those women, that God has used, queens and so on, that God has used over time. And I will tell you this. When you study the history of the English Bible, well, if, if, if you study the history of the Bible period, starting from the, the day of the New Testament writers until now, most of your study is going to involve England. Why? Because the popes lost their ecclesiastical power over England in the... 1500s with Henry VIII that wicked no good hell deserving king stood up and said if you won't let me get my day boars I'm going to cut y'all off and he cut off the popes quit sending them money and said we're going to start our own church boom and at that point the popes realized that they, did, they had lost their power in England and what happened? The Word of God sprang out of that. Boom! And I mean, it exploded. 
from like 1500 on, it just took over. There was actually a war in England, a civil war. The British, the English Civil War was a war of the Protestant zealots in Parliament who decided that the king did not have any real authority over them, that the Word of God did, and they took the king out and they cut his head off in public and Oliver Cromwell became Lord Protectorate of England and won the war and ruled over England with Parliament as long as he was there. When his son took over, his son was not like his daddy. His son was real weak and so that's when the kings took the, the kingdom back over and the monarchy reigns, which is not a bad thing because you know as well as I do that this Bible is under the king's or the queen's patent. That it's patented and copyrighted by the monarch of England. And as long as the monarch's on the throne, it cannot be altered. God, you're smarter than us. But that I'm telling you, the story of the Bible itself will take you to England because at that time, the popes, they had control over all of your, more control than Hitler had. All over Europe, the popes ruled over those kings and told them, you scatter these Puritans, you scatter these uh, Calvinists, you get those Huguenots out, you, you cut their head off, burn them alive, do whatever you got to, send word that we're not going to tolerate this stuff. And the popes ruled over every other nation in England or in Europe, but England. So that's, that's why the King James came about and is the greatest Bible to ever be born in this world. That's what I believe. Yep. And she really liked it. Good. And I talked to her yesterday and I said, what Bible are they going by? She said uh, that they gave her a good Bible. I said, look and see what kind of Bible it is. Uh-huh. You're laughing. You already know that. Mm -hmm. We knew it. It was the NIV. Yeah, Bible. I knew that. Good for him. There you go. There you go. Amen. That'll save a Catholic. Yeah. All right. I got to get to this. Listen to this now. Um, there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. This is the seven spirits of God, the spirit of wisdom and understanding. This is what God wants out of the common man, understanding. Whereas in the papacy, to this day, they still say only the cardinals and the magisterium with the Pope can interpret the Bible for you. You cannot interpret the Bible for yourself. You're not qualified. They put people on spiritual levels. And if you're not in the priesthood, and even if you're not a cardinal, you're not as good as the cardinals and the popes are. You're not as good to God as those high up men are. That's how they see everybody in the world. They put them all in categories. And some of them get to buy their salvation and don't have to go to purgatory, they think. Anyway, but God wants the common man to have understanding. The spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge. He wants them to have knowledge of the word of God. And that's what men like John Huss um, in uh, Bohemia and um, um, uh, w William Tyndale and John Wycliffe. That's what people like that did was they interpreted or they translated the Bible into the English that the people could understand. Now, I read this last week. And I'm going to move on. In Esther chapter 1. Notice this. This is what the king did. He sent letters. This, this is a wicked king, King Ahasuerus. He does not know God. He does not follow the, the law of Moses. But he sent letters into all the king's provinces and into every province according to the writing thereof and to every people after their language. He was smart enough to know that you don't send them something written in Babylonian or Sumerian or whatever language he spoke. 
You don't send them something like that and have some guy stand up and read it to them. You send it to them in their language. That every man should bear rule in his own house and that it should be published according to the language of every people. Underline that in your Bible. And say to your friends, look, the Bible says that it's supposed to be published according to the language of every people. Psalm 68, 11, the Lord gave the word. Great, listen to this. Great was the company of those that published it. You know what that means? Made it public. At the time of John Wycliffe, most of the priests in England could not read the Latin Bible. They were lax in their studies and they refused to learn the Latin language and retain it. You have to keep working at this to retain it and use it, right? And so they let it get out of use because they figured, well, we're priests. And at that time, those priests, they were molesting women. They were going around getting money. They were taking over. At the time of John Wycliffe, the Church of Rome owned one third of the land of England. If somebody died, that, that priest would go to their widow and say, if you don't have enough money to say the mass, we can't get him out of purgatory. I guess you'll have to hand over your land. And would steal the land from those people. And the, the, the bishops of, of Rome in England actually were more like the barons. They were, land, they were the rich, wealthy landowners that ruled over their little section of England. And they were all told what to do by the Archbishop of Canterbury and then by the Pope. But anyway, great was the company of those that published it. And these men and these women that have worked tirelessly over the years to make public the word of God. Uh, there was a, there's a movie, you ought to, you know, I saw it years ago and I thought I'd probably find it on YouTube and I did. And it's about John Wycliffe. And I encourage you to watch it. Because, and apparently this is a true story. This man and this woman came up to uh, John. He was a priest. And, but they knew him to be a good man. And they, they, the, the woman was crying hysterically. And the man said that, you know, our baby died a year ago. And, um, and she just, she'd been crying all this time. And, and, and he said, why are you crying? She said, because the priest told us that all babies that are not baptized turn into fireflies in the summertime. And she says, every time in the summertime, when I look out in the evening and I see the fireflies, I see my baby wandering out around out there. She was told that by her priest. And her priest probably was so stupid, he didn't know the truth either. And Wycliffe said, I guarantee you. He told her, you know what he did? He told her the story of David. And how David's baby went to heaven. And he said, Mama, you're going to see your baby in heaven. Don't you worry. Trust in Christ. Mm, 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 mm. That got him in trouble. That got him in trouble. Now, how beautiful upon the mountains. This is Isaiah 52, 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings. That is the literal interpretation of the word gospel. Good tidings. That publishes peace. That bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation. Look at this. Publisheth peace. This is a book, a book of peace. The Prince of Peace is this book. That bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation. This book is where your salvation is. If you think you're going to get it from the priest, he's lying to you. He's telling you, you've got to eat Jesus and drink his blood or you will not go to heaven. And you must continue to do it all your life. Or you, you miss one time, you're going to hell. That saith unto Zion, thy God reigneth. Nahum 115, behold upon the mountains the feet of him that bringeth good tidings. Says it again, that publisheth peace. O Judah, keep thy solemn feast, perform thy vows, for the wicked shall no more pass through thee. He is utterly cut off. Mark chapter 5, verse 20, and he departed and began to publish. Means make public. In Decapolis, how great things Jesus had done for him and all men did Marvel, the greatest testimony that the Bible has is your testimony of the Bible, what it did for you. Amen. Don't turn people on to this church or Pastor Mike. Turn them on to the Bible. Amen to that. Now, this is the book, Translators Revived. I don't know who wrote it. I don't know how I got it. It's in, it's in rough condition, 
But I started going through it. And I'm just like, so I want to read to you a little bit about William Tyndale. What happened in his, this is his Bible. This is 1526, okay? And I read some of that to you last Wednesday night. Here it is. Uh, For there are three which bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And <laughs> these, and these three are one. That's, that's it. Same, same words. Same words. Now, um, Tyndale, William Tyndale was disputing with a divine, that's what they called the priest back then, with a divine reputed to be quite learned. He was a scholar. Tyndale utterly confounded him with certain texts of scripture. Why? Because this man didn't know the Bible. Upon which the irritated papist, means he favored the Pope, exclaimed, it were better for us to be without God's laws than without the Pope's. That, listen, they all fell in line with, you know why? Because the Pope would have them excommunicated. And back then, if you were, listen, you kick me out of this church, I think I'm still going to heaven. Okay? If I, if I, if I toss you out of here, you can still go to heaven. I'm not, I, I don't have any say in your salvation whatsoever. But back then, you got excommunicated. You're, not, you're going to hell forever. And that's how it was. Either that or they cut your head off or they burn you at the stake alive. Or they burn your whole family while you're watching. And so this was a little too much for Tyndale who boldly replied, I defy the Pope and all his laws. And if God spare my life, ere many years, I will cause a boy that driveth the plow to know more of the scripture than you do. Now remember that statement, okay? He now clearly saw that nothing could rescue the mass of the English nations, talking about the people, from the postures of the high priests and low priests of Rome unless the scriptures were placed in the hands of all. Which thing only, he says, moved me to translate the New Testament because I had perceived by experience how that it was impossible to establish the lay people in any truth except the scripture were plainly laid before their eyes in the mother tongue. That means their language. And I can tell you, I have seen it in people that when I go someplace and I'm teaching things or whatever, and the light comes on in there and I see it and they just, they, they gasp for breath because scriptures, a scripture that I have not even used is going through their mind and in their heart and they're making connections. I don't do that. I give the word of God to them and the word of God does it. Light comes on. So he said, um, you got, you got to give them scripture. So. He had this translated into English. Not long after Tyndale's death, Lord Cromwell, acting as vice regent to the king, ordered that a copy of the Bible in English should be conveniently placed in every parish church at the expense of the parson and the parishioners, and no man should be in any way discouraged from reading or hearing it read. But contrary wise, that every person should be stirred up and exhorted to the diligent study of the word of God. See, the Bible says where the words of a king are, there's power. And this came right down from the king. I, I, I read something, John, I mentioned King Edward VI. He was a boy king. He was crowned when he was nine. He died of consumption when he was 16. In his short span, in fact, at his, at his coronation, it was a, um, some kind of tradition that when he walks to the throne, that he's followed by three men, all carrying one sword apiece. And these three swords represent, you know, power this or whatever. And the boy, Edward VI, said to the men who were designing his coronation, no, there's going to be four swords this year. And they said, what would be the fourth sword? He said, the sword of the word of God. Nine years old. So in every church, watch this. 
According to this English historian Stripe, the Bibles were secured by a chain to a reading desk attached to one of the pillars in the churches so that nobody could steal it. It was wonderful to see with what joy this book of God was received, not only among the learneder, that's a real word, real word. I didn't misspell it, that's how it was, the learneder sort, but generally all England over, among all the vulgar and common people. That's what vulgar means, common. And the Latin vulgate was in the common Latin, not in the scientific Latin, not in the scholastic Latin. It was written in the common Latin so that people that spoke Latin could read it and understand it. Um, and w with what greediness the word of God was read and what resort to places where the reading of it was. Everybody that could bought the book or busily read it or got others to read it to them if they could not themselves. Divers, many more elderly people learn to read on purpose. Why? So they could read the Bible. And even little boys flocked among the rest to hear portions of the Holy Scriptures read. What did Tyndale say? That the boy who pulls the plow will know more of the Scriptures than that priest did. <laughs> Woo! Amen. Now, Let's have some fun, all right? Open your Bible. Do a little comparing here. I had to, I had to brush up. This is a Wycliffe Bible. Uh, it had Old Testament, New Testament, and Apocrypha. He was a Catholic priest. But you know what he did? Before Wycliffe got into the translating business, he wrote books. He was a scholar at Oxford, and they just gave him time to, he could teach when he wanted to. He could sit and study books all day long, which is what he liked to do. And um, he wrote a book and came to the conclusion that transubstantiation was a heresy. And he said, that wafer that you have is no more the body of Christ than it is anything else. And buddy, I want to tell you what, if he hadn't died first of a stroke, they surely would have killed him. Forty years later, a new pope comes up and writes a letter and says, I want you to dig his bones up and I want you to have a ceremony. I want you to burn them in front of everybody and then dump them into this little brook that's in this town. And that brook runs into a bigger river and that river runs into the sea. And they said, thus the ashes of of John Wycliffe going from his place there in England to all the shores around the world. And so are the work of John Wycliffe on every shore in this, con in this world. In other words, the Word of God. First John, turn there. You ready? Oh, I'm going to turn here. Tell you what. Let's just, let's just do uh, chapter 1. Now, again, this Bible was translated. His life spanned from 1320 to 1384. And he was working on it well into his death. Okay? He had a lot of his students that loved him. And they didn't care what the Catholic Church said. They were going to help him out. So a lot of this was translated by his students, but with his oversight. And, um, and the only thing he had was that Latin Vulgate, the common language Latin Bible. So let's read 1 John chapter 1. And like I said, it took me a little while to, to figure this out, but I think I got, I think I got my leg up on it now. Uh, that thing, now it's not going to be word for word, but it's going to be, I'm going to say pro probably 95% the same. That thing that was from the beginning. I know the King James says that which was from the beginning. Which we heard in. What does that mean? It's yeah, past tense of heard. Heard in. <laughs> this, is, this is early English. Okay. Which we heard in. Which we say in with our, which we say in with our eye in. Which we've seen with our eyes. Which we beheld in. And our hondas touched in 
of the word of life. And the life is showed. What does it say there? Manifest, which means showed. It's spelled S-C-H-E-W-I-D. Shewed. Okay? Verse 2. And we saying, and we witnessing, and telling to you. I sound like that guy in the Star Wars movies. You know who I'm talking about? Yeah. And we saying, and we witnessing, and telling to you the everlasting life that was anentis, which means with the Father, and appeared to us. Therefore, we tell unto you that thing that we seen and heard in, that also ye have fellowship with us, and our fellowship be with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we write in this thing to you, that ye have joy, and that your joy be full. Mm. And this is the telling that we heard in of him and telling to you that God is light and there been no darknesses in him. Amen. I can understand that. Now I'm going to pause here for a minute and I'll tell you an experience I had. As we were going to Missouri Bible Camp and, and my buddy Craig Shaw was there and he, he heard me do this. There was a young man there that had gone to the Bible College in Nashville and I knew that college because I went to it and I knew that I knew the type of people that were there the rich free will Baptist put their kids in that college they sent their sons and daughters there so that their their good Christian sons and daughters would hook up with a, another Christian son or daughter and marry there and they would be well connected and they would have money and they would they would be the ones getting denominational jobs and being put in certain churches you understand that there's politics in in all denominations and i got sick of it it was in oklahoma in a different way they're country folk there but it was just a different way of politics but in nashville it was this it was this uh uh southern wealth okay and um and it, it just it, i it just i was sick of, or i rebelled there i got almost enough demerits in one semester to get kicked out almost if I'd have tried harder, I could have made it. But I didn't want to mess up the year. So I just, I just come home, married Lisa. I said, forget it. Okay? She had a lot to say about that too. Anyway, um, but that, that uh, I don't know where I was going with that. Anyway. Um, oh, this, this guy, this young this young man, he was, he was in his senior year, and he was going to go on after he graduated this Bible college in Nashville. He was going to go on, and he was going to get a degree. He was going to get his degree in theology. Then he was going to go probably there in Nashville to one of the colleges there. Um, Vanderbilt was, was right close to that college and so on. And he was going to get a degree in philosophy. And he said, I want to go and pastor country churches and teach them higher thinking skills philosophy and i just detected the the youthful arrogance i've had it i i was you would you hated me oh you would hate i was pitiful but i had that youthful arrogance before and i recognized it in him and i i just kind of started a little tit for tat with him on the bible issue and um we went round and round. And I, I finally said, let me ask you one question. I said, you obviously know my position here. I'm holding a Bible in my hand. It's a King James. Can I go to one of the churches that you're talking about you're going to be the pastor of? And sit down with somebody in that community who's lost. And with this Bible only, can I show them the way of salvation? He froze. And stood there for a long time. He knew he had stepped in my trap. And the trap was he wanted to say they can't because it's not the originals. 
But he knew if he said that, I'd have him. I'd have him. And I would, I would ask him, are you saved? Am I saved? Brother Craig here, is he saved? Is anybody here saved? Show me the originals. And he froze for the longest time. Very uncomfortably so. And finally he said, yes. And that was it. That was it. He walked off. I have to admit, I had a little pride over that. That's all right. God beat the devil out of me over it. But that's what he, that was my experience with him. Was he, had, he, was, he was of that opinion. Only the originals. Only the originals. Verse 6. If we sin that we hand fellowship with him and we wandering in darkness, we lie in and do not truth. But if we walk in, in light as he is in light, we hand fellowship to Gidder and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we see in that we hand no sin, we deceive us self. We deceive ourselves. And truth is not in us. Now, y'all know verse 9. If we knowledge in, knowledge in, confess, you make known, knowledge in our sins, he is faithful and just that he forgive to us our sins and cleanse us from all wickedness is unrighteousness. They are the same. And if we sin, we had not sinned, we make in him a liar and his word is not in us. Somebody say amen. Imagine you are a poor peasant and one of Wycliffe's priests, he had them all, he had them scattered all over England. The priest that really knew that they weren't going too far in the priesthood, they weren't going to get one of those bishop jobs where they get all the land. They, they're the ones who took to Wycliffe and he's, he taught them, he gave them as much copies as he could. He sent them out all over England, scattered them all over the place and said, go to all these villages and you, you read to them the word of God and they'll believe it because it's the word of God. Amen. And if, and if, listen, the differences that I just read, I understand it. Yeah, it's really not that different. And we're talking 1300s. This is the 20, 2020s. So how many years are we talking about? 700, almost 800 years. Almost 800 years. The Bible being published in the English language. It started a firestorm in England. Brought revival to all the world. One third, it's estimated that about one third of the population of the planet Earth can speak or understand some form of English. I can take this King James Bible and read it all over Kenya. And you ought to see, you ought to, well, you saw it, Chris. All, all the road signs, all the signage out there. It's some Swahili. You see English everywhere. You can read this and what they don't understand, somebody can translate for them. That's a gift of the Spirit. I'm satisfied. You know what he told me? You know what that young man told me? When I told him, I, he, he made the statement, he made that stupid statement that which King James do you believe in? 1611, or the ones that they changed afterward. I said, uh-uh. You're not going to pull that on me. I've got a 1611 Bible. In fact, I've been hiding this in my office. I'm going to put it out in a foyer somewhere. One of our watchers sent me this a couple years ago. When I got it, the glass was broke. But when I opened it up, I started bawling. This is a page from the 1611 King James Bible. Now, this is not our idol. 
But this stands as a testimony that the Bible 420 years ago is still readable. It's the same. This is the book of uh, Exodus chapter, let's see, XXIX. So that's 29, 28 and 29. If I turn the page over, it'd be 29 and 30 probably. But this, I found out there's a company that sells these. You can buy a whole page for 200, 300 bucks, something like that. And uh, I had to take it to Hobby Lobby to get new glass put on it. But um, anyway, we're going to find a place out in the lobby and hang this up somewhere. And, um, or you can get a whole Bible if they still have them. Um, but folks, I just want to encourage you. You're not wrong. You're not wrong with sticking with the Bible. Now, I told y'all something that I told you a lie a few weeks ago. Maybe last week I told you a lie. I told you that the Greek Bible that I had in Bible college would have been probably the 26th edition of the Greek text. It wasn't. I got it out today. I showed John. It's the 21st revision, which means from 1984, when this book was published, to now, they've changed it seven times. They've changed the Greek text seven different editions, seven different times. At times, they would have a, a Greek reading the way they saw it back 20, 30 years ago that would change the translation and then years later, change it back. Change it back. So now all these Bible companies, what do they got to do? They got to keep up with that. They're in the 28th now. They're, they're going to put out the 29th at some time. I don't know when. And the last word I had was there was still a Jesuit priest on the committee. Okay? And I'm telling you, Rome doesn't belong in our churches. So Rome's Bible does not belong from our pulpits. Amen. Amen. Mark 13, 10, the gospel must first be what? Published, made public. People got to hear it. And the only way they can hear it is in their language. Return to thine own house, Luke 8, 39, and show how great things God hath done unto thee. And he went his way and published throughout the whole city how great things Jesus had done unto him. Acts 10, 37, that word I say ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. Acts 13, 49, and the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. Mm, that gets me. They took the word of God. And if, and if I, I would ask any Catholic, why in the face of all that you've just read, why do you still insist that only the priest can tell you what God said? When the evidence says that they made the word of God known to everybody that wanted to hear it. Why? Amen.